living. So in the medical term, a sense, there's what is called blood transfusions. Okay, some of you may have had some condition where you may have needed a blood transfusion. Spiritually, there is a sense where there has been a transfusion that has taken place, not in a literal wooden natural sense, but in spiritual terms. And, and what that is saying is that we have been changed. No longer do we have what? The old nature, but we have a new nature. What is that new nature? That new nature is the life of Christ working in us. But do we still have to attend with the old nature? Absolutely. All right. So, but Matt. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, uh, we, uh, we are constantly in trouble. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Corrupt flesh. That's right. We always be struggling. We always struggle to be satisfied. Right. You sure got that right. Yes, sir. That's for, you know, it's, it's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And then our flesh right now, yes, again, talking about salvation, this, this, and saved. <laughs> okay, we're saved in our inner person. Okay, in our spirit. And our job is to do what? We talked about it, bring our flesh into subjection. And God doesn't come and do all of that for us. He gives us responsibility. Right. He helps us, he empowers us, gives us the necessary tools. But he wants us to work and bring them. And we, there has to be a conscious decision that has to be effort put into bringing this body under subjection. And sometimes that in and of itself becomes a battle. Sometimes people don't want to do that. But you have to work and bring it. Question of Pastor, do you, some people say it like we are saved or being saved, we will be saved. Do you, do you have any problem with that? Not at all. Matter of fact, I use that term myself and we will, with the help of God, uh, bring that out. We are saved. Okay? Past tense. This is for the believer. The believer only. Right. Okay? We are saved. At some point in time in our life, God dealt with us. We exercised faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God saved us. Okay? That's past tense. Present tense. We are being saved because we are to walk with God, we are to walk in the Spirit, as Paul brings out in Galatians chapter 5. All right? And we will be saved. That will be saved is what I call the process of glorification. When the Lord comes back, then he's going to change even these bodies. So this is when our bodies, in glorification, this is when our bodies are going to get saved. But we got to work with these bodies right now. And then God is going to ultimately save these bodies. Now, and this is why it is, in, it, it is important for us and our natural bodies to be good stewards of these bodies, but no matter how much we work out, no matter how much we eat, right, no matter how many vegetables you eat, okay, you are not going to save these natural bodies. Amen. Now, it's good to manage them, you know, it's good to jog, work out, lift some weights, walk, uh, you know, get your 10,000 steps in, or whatever, so you can get ready. Trying to do, do it. That, that's good. You know, you want to eat fried food? Don't eat fried food, you know. Uh, you start out living it twice a week instead of every day. <laughs> then uh, go to one day a week, you know. But do something. Be mobile. Don't just be a couch potato. Do something. Keep it moving. Dance. Something. Just do the right dance, okay? <laughs> Um, but it's God that will save these bodies. Amen. And he will say, and it's guaranteed, and that's the beautiful thing, it is guaranteed yes. for the believer well, who say that God is going to save these bodies. So and that's why we have to, you know, I use the term, we have to play our role out. We have to stay in the fight, stay in the race, okay, stay in the church, okay, <laughs> remain a part of the body of Christ that, and then God is going to deal with these bodies. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, my goodness. Man, I'm going to have such a body. It's going to be so wonderful. All the imperfections are going to be gone. I don't think I'm going to have any gray hair to contend with. Okay, uh, pimples. I'm not going to have to get all my teeth back. I've got a couple missing right now. 
what you want. It's none of your business. <laughs>
then they can't really need somebody to cry. And that gospel uh, brings uh, salvation to a person when they do what? When they believe. So here's a thought-provoking question. Can you have salvation without the Holy Spirit? I'm not asking to answer that out loud at this point, but it's thought-provoking. If a person has salvation, and that salvation came as a direct result of the preaching of the gospel, and they believed in the gospel, and that gospel has the power to deliver them, can they be delivered without the Holy Spirit? Just keep that in mind. All right, go over to Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, look at verse number 1. Romans chapter 4, uh, verse number 1, we have the situation of the story in regards to Abraham. And it gets back to the question that uh, Greg brought up uh, earlier about how should we look at, um, you know, this imputation of, of, uh, of what God is doing. Uh, from a medical standpoint or from a scientific standpoint, whatever standpoint we may want to call it, look at what happens here. Romans 4 verse 1. It says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was what? Justified by words, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham what? He God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Verse 4, not to him who works. The wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted as for righteousness. Then he brings up David in verse 6. You can go ahead and read that. Just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God does what? Impute righteousness apart from works. So if God imputes righteousness and righteousness is imputed or charged or applied to that individual through the process of justification, the question still stands that if the Bible says a person is justified when they believe, can they be justified without the Holy Spirit? Can they be righteous? Can anybody be righteous without the Holy Spirit? Aren't those, aren't those, isn't that an interesting question? So if you believe that God will bring salvation, then uh, we uh, can at this point perhaps safely conclude that if a person has salvation based upon their belief, they can't have salvation without the operation of the Holy Spirit. And remember, we already talked about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and how he works. So if a person is justified and made righteous, can they be justified and made righteous without the Holy Spirit? It is the Holy Spirit that produces righteousness no. in an individual. No one can live right without God working in them. Paul said, when I tried to do right, what did he say? Evil was what? Always present with me. All right? So I, I, I take it you want a little more. All right. Let's go to the uh, book of Romans and read. Uh, uh, well, I tell you what, let's just, since we're here, just stop by uh, Romans chapter 8. Alright, Romans chapter 8 says this, uh, just a, a couple of verses here, of course we all know the whole chapter is good, but look at verse 9, I believe, Romans 8 and right. 9, what does it say? Okay, that's, uh, let's see, oh, okay, cool. alright, uh, well, okay, we'll just go ahead and go to verse number 9 for that. Uh, it says, but what? But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed is what? The Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not here. So if a person is justified, they're justified by who? They're justified by God. And if they're justified, God also does what? Imputes righteousness unto them. So God makes them right with him. 
and puts them in a position to be able to live a life of righteousness. Now, he says in Romans 8, 9, he says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if yes. indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. We have already concluded that no one can be right or justified without the spirit working. Question, comment. I'm going to read more. Okay. All right. So, you got to already have the Spirit working in you. Remember John 3. Jesus said, The wind does what? Blows with this. You can't tell where it's coming or where it's going. But you can hear the sound of love. You can feel the effects of it. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. If anybody who believes, and they have faith. They come into a relationship with God. And that has to be <clears throat> that they are regenerated and or born again. Now, watch this. How many times are you born natural? Once. Once. <laughs> and that's all you can be. <laughs> so, when you're born again, born again clearly establishes the fact that a person has already been born once. You cannot be born again naturally. So when you use the term born again, the text is very clear in John 3 that one is born of the Spirit. Spirit. That's what born again means. So that which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. So a person receives the Spirit at what point? When they are born again. And born again is what? A God thing. It is a mystical miracle, a direct move and operation of God that nobody has anything to do with. We just read in Romans 4, if it was by works, then Abraham could have boasted. But his boast would have meant nothing before God. We just read that in Romans 4. Okay? So anybody that does any kind of work and says that their work that they did is what produced salvation in them, they have just violated Romans 4. They have violated Romans because nobody can boast of works. And we know Abraham did do some good works. But God did not take his good works and say and tell him, it is your good works that brought about your righteousness. It was your faith. It was you believing. Okay? So, so um, uh, uh, let me get this last one, and then um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get uh, your hands uh, there. So, go over to uh, Romans uh, chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9. <laughs> well, go to Romans chapter 10. So we'll skip 9 uh, to 9. He gets back and he's talking about God's elected choice and how he did it. But, but, but Romans 10 gets us right down, as we say, to the nitty gritty. All right? Romans uh, 10, verse number 6. Oh, man. All of this is good, but just to cut corners, verse 6, he says, what? But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who's going to ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss to bring Christ up from the dead? No, and why uh, uh, is Paul saying it? Because Christ already, what? He already came from heaven. Okay? And, and, and not only did he come from heaven, but he walked this earth, then he died and went to the grave, but what happened? He was resurrected. So the point is, Christ ain't doing that work anymore. He did it how many times? Once. Once. A person is born again how many times? Once. Once. Okay? So this work of Christ's ministry uh, only happened one time. He says, but in verse number 8, he said, but what does the scripture say? The word is what? Near you, in your mouth, 
and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, watch this, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, here's that question again. Can anybody be saved without the Holy Spirit? No. It is absolutely impossible to be saved without the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that what? That saved the person. So at what point then does the Holy Spirit come in? When a person believes, and that a, as a result of their belief, then there is a confession with the mouth from the heart. And this is not just an arbitrary confession. It's not just something that is just, you know, randomly said, but this is a confession with true conviction. And when that happens, God has promised that that person will be saved. He says in verse 10, with the heart one believes unto righteousness. When the mouth of confession is made unto wow. And we've already talked about righteousness and salvation in Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 4. So when the Holy Spirit indwells a person, this is where the manifestation of that true confession through faith will be made known. All right? Question, comment. Try to shorten the question. Okay. So what 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 was it that Abraham believed? Okay. That. Right. What was it that Abraham believed? Right. I, I don't unless well, I'm missing something. I'm, I don't see a gospel message that he believed. Right. Was it was it a, a, that God judges the the authenticity of the belief to help? Here's what Abraham believed. Mm -hmm. The scripture is very short. In, in that response. Abraham believed God. Now, we do not all together know all what Abraham understood, but here's what we do know. That Abraham knew Adam. Okay? Abraham knew Adam. Abraham knew Noah. And remember, the gospel message is passed down. The gospel message is preached in Genesis chapter number 3. So that gospel message is passed down. No one knew something about God. All the Bible doesn't take time to, as, you know, as you're uh, uh, bringing up uh, by your question to go into detail and tell us everything. He says he believed. But he believed God. So if you believe God and you understood creation through Adam and through what Adam did, remember Adam lived 930 years. So Adam had plenty of time to preach the gospel, share the gospel with his children. And we know he shared something with his children because Seth is not born. Okay. And the Bible clearly lets us know that Seth was a godly man. Yes. Okay, Noah found what? Grace. You cannot separate grace from the gospel message. So they knew something about okay. the gospel in that sense. Okay? And this is why it's so beautiful for us today because we got the whole message now. Right. Yeah. Thou art inexcusable, old man. <laughs> Whoever you are and live in this day, right. all right, y'all, come on. We're going to need the Bible. We're going to put struggle on old stuff. We're going to need to be struggling on it. Yeah. All right, so you cannot be righteous. You cannot be justified. You cannot have salvation without the working of the Holy Spirit. And it's not by man's work. People of God, that's freedom. <laughs> and some people don't want to be free. So they want to be bound. They want to go through all of these 12 steps. You know why? Because they're bound in their thinking and in their tradition. Ooh, but you're free when you can believe in the God of righteousness who imputes it. Because here's what ultimately happens. People that feel that they have to work a certain way to follow seven steps to get it. Then they now feel they gotta follow those seven steps to keep it. Then they gotta follow another seven steps because they lost or messed up the first seven steps. So now they gotta add another seven steps to come back. So old people are told, them, well, you remember how you got it the first time, go back and do that all over again. And the Bible doesn't teach that. Right? The Bible teaches that a person slipped and they messed up to confess. 
their sin. God is faithful and just to forgive them. All right? Okay. Well, y'all got me working. Yeah. Y'all yeah. got me working. I see that hand, but it's just that I'm waiting on y'all questions. All right. Oh, y'all got it. They don't? I figured it was just that. Genesis 15, he said it was 4 through 6. All right, 4 through 6. Go ahead and read that. Uh, and behold the word of the Lord. I'm sorry, this is in the guy described it in the ESV. And behold the word of the Lord came to him. This is Abraham. Right. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven. And, and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So, so shall, shall your descendants be. And he did what? Believe in the Lord, and he counted it for righteousness. The for right. And remember, along with that promise, God tells him that all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through your seed. Right? Not seeds. Seed. Through your seed. And that becomes the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the ultimate fulfillment of that is what God spoke in Genesis chapter 3. Right. Okay? About the promised seed of the Messiah. <coughs> okay? So like I said, sometimes when you say, you know, we will get God, I wish there was a little more about what you told Abraham. But to me, it seems pretty clear that that gospel message had to be mixed in, passed down from one generation to the next. And this is why no generation, no generation had that excuse. No. Even what we call 400 years of silence. Because you know what they had before it got silent? Word. They had the Old Testament prophets. And that's the word of God. They had the law. And the law and the prophets and the songs, they all talked about who? Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. That was to come. So no generation is left with, uh, you know, letting say, well, God, I have a reason. I just didn't know. Yes, you did. And if you think you didn't know, because you said the law was burned, just look up. <laughs> Creation is preaching. Cloud. <laughs> so there is no uh, excuse. Okay? Yes, but uh, I was to have him. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So um, let us go now to Ephesians chapter number one. In Ephesians chapter one, it says this. Remember, faith, belief and faith. Keep those two terms in line. Belief, faith. <coughs> Now my son, now my daughter, 
It's just a matter of time. You're going to find out that you did not birth an angel. We are birth sin creatures. They were born with the Adamic nature. Amen. 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 And as one of our children, we none of us birthed the John the Baptist, nor did we birth the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Question, comment. Yes, sir. Bishop. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I got my old Bible, the King James. Oh, no, that's but fine. It it, mm -hmm. But it still doesn't change it for what you were saying. Yes, sir. So when you look at six and uh, seven that you read, uh -huh. you know, um, I know you may not want to go there, but <laughs> no, anyway, no, we are here. The, the, uh, you know how the folks want to say that group you want to say that mm -hmm. uh, uh, you you was elected before the foundation. Mm -hmm. Well, according to this, it talks about the blood that wasn't before. The, I mean, can you address that? Right. Well, you have those that want to limit what can possibly happen to a person that believes. They would say there's only an elect group. But this election is dealing with what God does and what he makes possible and available to all those who may believe. So we're talking about the Calvinists who said that there is only a certain group that is elect before the foundation mm -hmm. of the world and whoever that group is, they're the only ones that are uh, elect and they teach that in what is called a deterministic way. Mm -hmm. Then even, and this is a passion that they use, but this is a passage that those who don't believe that use as well oh. to come <laughs> against what they're trying to say. Okay. Because I have a hard time of accepting anyone that says, okay, you're elect, but you're ain't, you're not. You know, the last I looked, God sent his son to die for the sins of the world. And whosoever, whosoever. okay, and that whosoever is not putting the honest on the individual as far as them saying that I have the power to save myself, but it's whosoever comes to God. Mm -hmm. Whoever comes to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who does the save? God does. No one can save themselves, but God made us three more creatures where we can exercise our will and make decisions. Okay, now we can really get, and, then, and we're gonna, that's gonna come back up uh, as well when we talk about uh, realize the salvation, well, ultimately I should say salvation. So, uh, but there are those that believe they're just, you know, this select group. You know, in other words, some people, you're, you're born, you're just destined to go to hell. You're not going to be saved, you can't be saved because you are not elect. Okay, and uh, that's problematic. Yes. That's problematic. Okay, yes, sir. That hand. Okay, all right. Uh, the baby, the baby got the hand. She wants to go I said, Mom, it's a baby. Watch, she has, of course, that's going to be one of the most profound courses that we have to do. <laughs> All right, so um, where we at? Okay, verse number, um, all this is good, but jump down to verse number 11, just for the sake of time. It says, What? In him also we have, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose. That's a very important word. You would say according to the purpose. Anyone that you say we are predestined according to the purpose. In other words, God has a purpose. Whoever comes to the purpose of God, hmm. then uh, they will be the ones who will be a recipient of the blessings of God. So they're predestined to according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. God sets the parameters. God has determined whosoever will what? Let them come. Whoever comes and they believe in faith, here's what God says I'm going to do. Okay? I'm going to uh, save them. I'm going to impute unto them righteousness. I am going to deliver them from sin and translate them from darkness into the kingdom of my dear son. Or whosoever will. Let them come. Come, every one of you. Drink of the waters of life. You read Isaiah 55 and the book of Revelation, chapter number 22. It lets us know that it's open for whosoever we are. Now, we all know, and there is no argument, that some people just ain't coming. Some people, the gospel can be presented to them, so to speak, and hit them right on the side of the bed, and they will reject it. And this is why, even as preachers, every week, we can preach the gospel and people can hear us and hear the gospel message, but may not come. Amen. And when they don't come, then it's, it's on them. All right? Now, let me, let 
let me get to uh, uh, get to this and I give you a hand. One moment here. All right, it says in verse 12 that we, watch this, who first did what? Trusted in Christ. Christ. Now, we who first trusted in Christ. Trusted in Christ would uh, uh, include both of the words that we've already talked about. Belief and faith. When we trust in Christ, this is a manifestation of the very fact that when they heard the gospel message, they believe the gospel message, and they have come to place their faith in this gospel message. You and I were born again. Part of being born again, what the Holy Spirit does is help teach us to do what? No matter what, to continue to trust in Christ. This is why it is dangerous to couple your salvation all the time with the feeling and emotion. Amen. Because being saved, sometimes you're not going to feel saved. <laughs> That's right. Amen. And this is why church can be so difficult sometimes. When people, you know, go through all week and they come on Sunday morning and want the preacher to lift them up. And the preacher got to fight through all those spirits, <laughs> the attitudes and all of that stuff. Because people come to church sometimes mad and angry. You know, they mad with the boss, mad with the spouse, mad with the children, mad with the neighborhood association, mad with the bank, mad with the bill collector, man. and they bring all of that to church. Say, now nah, I'm here, and I'm going to sit here, and I ain't going to praise the Lord, and I ain't going to say nothing until you preach me that. <laughs> now the preacher got to do cartwheels. Got to chuck them out. Got to slide on the floor like you James Brown. <laughs> and the people said, pick me up. You know why? Because it's all centered around emotion. Mm. But that's not what salvation is all about. Salvation is the very fact that you what? You trust it and you trust. Yeah. You believe and you faith. It ain't God that told you. There's no way in the Bible that told you you ever had to have necessarily a feeling. Now, there's nothing wrong with being excited. Right. You read the song, it talks about us praising God, worshiping God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay? So, um, wow, time is moving. But let me get down to this and get you going. It says, 13, in him you also trusted, and you heard the word of truth. Now, Paul says, now watch this, the gospel of your salvation. Romans 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, gospel for it is the power of God to salvation. salvation. Paul brings it up again. The gospel of your salvation in whom also having, watch this, believed. Having believed. When you believe, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, what is our job as we read the passage on this? Shout. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can do that. You can do that too. <laughs> but our job is simply to take the scripture for what it says. Yeah. Not as a brother part of brother, not all of this other stuff, just to simply take the scripture for what it says. All right, we've got a couple minutes. Questions? Go ahead. Yes, sir. And affect 
to be witness because they, they don't know what to tell the person now. They just think, no self. You know, when well, I tell you what, you just come to my church and, you know, on Sunday the, the, the preacher get up and then, uh, now there's going to come a part where you're going to say, is there one? When, 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 you, when you hear that, now you just go up. <laughs> no, no, there should be, is there one when you out there in the streets? And you lead them to Christ by simply telling them the gospel message and the praying that their faith and belief would be stirred. So this hinders evangelism when we're stuck in a traditional mindset. Where do you find in the Bible where it says, God has a mic sitting in the chair? Here's what you're going to do.
God, that you uh, come and share your word and study the scriptures and be reminded to talk about salvation, how to obtain it, who we are in you, what you've done. It is nothing that we've done, not works where we can boast as your great apostle that you have given to the church, stated. Uh, Father, help us to embrace the truth and help us to witness with passion and persuasiveness as we share the gospel to others. Father, we come to you on behalf of our dear sister, uh, yes, God, Lord. Um, yes. You know the situation, God. Yes. The loss of our grandson. Yes. Uh, God, yes. I yes. to give her strength. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes. Lord, uh, minister uh, to her needs. Yes. Lord, yes. help the family, God, uh, and those uh, others that are here that are suffering loss and bereavement. Father, you're able to uh, step in their situation and yes. help them yes. and yes. help their family. Somehow through this, let souls be drawn to you. Uh, protect us and keep us throughout this day until we meet again. In Jesus', In Jesus name. name. Amen. 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 <laughs> it's in the car. <laughs>